great to be here with Peter Fowler. Peter, welcome. It's uh, you're a you're a golfer that's had a a long and and wonderful career dating right back to 1977. Uh, it's a career where you've amassed 20 professional victories, uh, including, of course, the one here at Paraparamu Beach, which we're incredibly proud of, uh, back in 1993. And uh, it's obviously a course that you've you've enjoyed over your years. You've you've visited us many times, uh, and so we look at a Looking forward to, I guess, hearing those stories and as a golf club, uh, reconnecting with someone that's had their history etched in our history, which is which is a fantastic thing. You're affectionately known by the nickname of Chuck for obvious reasons, I guess. Um, but Peter, it's wonderful to have you with us on Legends of the Links. And uh, how, how does it find you tonight? No, no, it's uh, well, it's good. I'm just coming out of that lockdown, so. Uh... Looking forward to tomorrow and um, having my first game of golf. But um, no, I've been pretty good and uh, it's a good chance uh, the last couple of months just to um, catch up with all my jobs at home. So, Peter, you, you play under the Australian flag, but I understand you you lived in New Zealand and, you, and you've been living here for a, a number of years. How, how did that come about? Well, I married a Kiwi, so I've been living here for 22 years now and um, since I um, stopped living in London and... Uh, but it's it's been a great country to live in. It's um, I find it quite an easy, relaxed country to be in. Uh, people are great, you know. They're essentially, we're all Kiwis and Aussies are essentially the same, I think, as you would know living in Melbourne uh, some years ago. And um, but yeah, I've, I'm a Kiwi. I've got my national, uh, I've got my citizenship now in New Zealand, okay. so which I'm proud of. And uh, yeah, so I, I've really enjoyed it here. So you live in New Zealand now, but let's go back to where it all began. Uh, I understand you, you were born in New South Wales, Australia. What was early life like for a, a young Peter Fowler? Yeah, I was, I was born in, um, in uh, Sydney and um, lived at Beecroft, which is where Pennant Hills Golf Club was. So I, uh, my, you know, before I started playing golf at 12, I played soccer and um, cricket. You know, my father played uh, sort of country cricket in, in New South Wales against the English uh, test team. So that was a okay. couple of times. So that was pretty good. Um, but um, so I, I, I've got a great love of cricket. But um, just before I started high school, I had a first game of golf with my brother, older brother and his friends. And um, and then uh, my father got me, you know, a dozen lessons with the local pro, Ian Alexander at Pennadol's Golf Club. And... Uh, I started my love affair with golf then. Fantastic. And and how quickly did you progress in the game? At what stage did you realise that you were getting reasonably good at it? Um, I don't think... I, I started at 12 years old. I, I don't think... I, it was a slow progress. Um, I, um, I caddied at the golf club. And I caddied for the pro and some of the members and the assistant pros and all that sort of thing. But uh, it probably wasn't until I was 14 that I I went from shooting 95 to, to 75. And that was sort of happened just at Bondi Golf Club in Sydney at a schoolboy tournament. I shot five over par and on a, it's got one par four and eight par threes. And, uh, and then from then on, I was able to shoot in the 70s. So I had a, that was a quick, improvement my older brother we, we used to have a good tussle and all of a sudden I was beating him by 20 shots and he, he, he couldn't work out how that happened but um, I, had, I I was a, the only club I've ever been a member really was uh, Coffs Harbour Golf Club where my parents were from northern New South Wales at Coffs Harbour um, originally and then uh, so for holidays we went there and I got a membership there for five bucks a year for a sub junior and I got my first handicap was 14. And then the, the following week, I was on nine. And uh, so that was about 13, about 14 years old. And um, and then when I was assistant, when I started as assistant pro, I got, to, I think I was on about four handicap. But I was, I was a hard worker and um, sort of slowly progressed from there. Did you make any representative teams, you know, back in, in those early amateur days? No, I didn't. I didn't really play any amateur um, club golf. I, uh, with my handicap from Coffs Harbour, I, I, 
I played stroke events in the schoolboy tournaments in Sydney. And I used to, on the weekends, I would go to, say, Campbelltown or or, or, or some of the clubs around Sydney and play um, the um, Harry Va- the Varden events or the junior junior Varden events, just stroke play. So I only ever played stroke play golf. Um, no club golf at all. Um, my friends did, but I... And um, so I was really... You know, I was really just putting scores on the board. I didn't have um, sort of a handicap in Sydney, so. But that, I think that helped me playing all all over Sydney in the on the weekends and different clubs. It helped me. I could easily go from one course to another. So I think that probably I had a an eye for course management and how to work my way around a new golf course. Where a lot of my mates, we'd all play the same at Pennant Earls, and then they but they couldn't play. They played terrible when we played other golf courses, and I guess so. That was it was a good upbringing for my golf, anyway. So you went the apprenticeship route. So obviously you were, you were interested in going the club professional kind of career path and and and, and teaching the game. Was that was that where you were heading? Um, I, I think really for golf really evolved for me. I didn't uh, yeah, okay. We didn't have a lot of golf on TV back those days, but. Um, I mean, I, I was on the weekends um, for a couple of years before I finished school at 15. I was working in the club, in the pro shop on the weekends, one day a week. Um, and the pro during that time, he said, well, what are you going to do when you finish, when are you going to finish school? And I said, oh, well, as soon as I can, because I didn't enjoy that. Right. Um, and he said, well, you know, you can be the assistant pro if you want. I said, oh, that'd be great. So... Um, so that's really it. Just sort of fell in my lap, and I, I think I was very lucky. Ian was a he was a hard worker. He's a non-drinker. Um, I think that really helped me. Um, it was a good grounding for me, and I, I love working in the pro shop for forty-eight bucks a week for fifty-five hours. So yeah. I, when I think back, it's not very much money, and uh, yeah. but I loved every minute of it. So you completed your apprenticeship. I. Did the three years apprenticeship, um, and and during the apprenticeship, I we used to play trainee tournaments every Monday, thirty six holes. I think at that now nowadays they only play about eighteen holes and, and not so many. But um, we we played a lot of golf um, on the Mondays, and on the my day off was a Friday, and I used to go to the course we were going to play trainee tournaments at, and um, and and. I would play 36 holes on the Friday and then on the Monday we'd play the trainee tournament. And I think because of my um, course management skills and, and refresh, you know, good memory of the golf course, I, I played quite well in the uh, trainee tournaments. So how, how do you graduate from from that and playing trainee events and, and possibly the pro-am, I assume, to, to you know, starting to play... And, and forgive me what the what the circuit looked like back then, but I mean, was there would have been an Australasian circuit? Of course, it was. Um, you know, what was the progression? Like, how, how did that come about? Um, well, I, I, like I was ranked pretty high as assistant pro, and I I really only thought ever thought about playing. I never thought about being a club professional. Um, but but a lot of us, that's what we did back then. Wayne Grady was one. Greg Norman, he was he was a assistant pro at Beverly Park in Sydney for Bill and McWilliam um, a few years, a couple of years before me. But uh, it, each year you have to play, a, you know, you pass your playing sort of test. Yep. And, um, and I, I was doing that quite comfortably. That was, uh, that was no problem. And you did, you know, you did your exams, your book working and your club repairs and all that sort of thing. But um my main focus was really just playing, and uh, I think after in the sec my second year, I started to play. A, a, I got a national invite and played a few tournaments. Yeah, I still had to pre qualify, but I was allowed to to pre qualify, and I played three tournaments in 1977, um, and another three or four in 1978, and then then I finished my traineeship at the end of 78, and 79 was my first full year on the tour. And back then there was well, Australia and has always had a lot of pro am. So I, when I turned pro, I I played a lot of pro ams 
and I played the the tour. And on the tour, they had about seventeen events. Yeah, right. Okay, some of them were only some of them were only worth ten thousand dollars total prize money or fifteen thousand dollars. But uh, you know, I just travelled and played. And uh, did, did, and you tra- every- did your travels bring you across to New Zealand during that time? Uh, my first trip to New Zealand was nineteen eighty, and I played the New Zealand Open at. Um, at uh, Naamutu Golf Club in New Plymouth. Mm. That was a good when Buddy Allen won. I think Simon Arn, who I, I'm good friends with now, I think he finished second that year. Um, I don't think I came back in 81 or 82, but, but, I, but I was back in 84 and I think I played most of them after that. So move forward a couple of years there, just in between the years that you mentioned there, it's, it's 1983 and you, you teed it up in your National Open, the Australian Open. Um, not only teeing it up, I mean, talk us, talk us through that week and, and talk us through that event. Okay, well, uh, yeah, 1983, um, I just finished my first full year in Europe, played 14 events when we had Monday qualifying. And I think that after being a pro for six years and, and having a year in Europe, I, I was quite tough by then. Um, and when I think back, I counted up uh, all the all the competitive weeks I played leading up to that as eighty three Australian Open in the November. I'd played at forty three weeks a year for about six straight years, yeah. so you know I'd amassed two hundred and fifty weeks of competitive golf, grinding, travelling. So I think mental the mental toughness was was crucial in that situation, and um, you know although it was my first four-round tournament victory, I think the 250 competitive weeks really set me up and and, um, and you, you need that sort of, just all the skills and the mental toughness to be able to pull the event off like that. But um, I missed the cut the week before the Open um, in Warrnambool. And, uh, but anyway, I, I, um, I got to Kingston Heath, which I loved, and it was rock hard that year. It was really, really difficult. Right. And uh, the things, a couple of things I remember about the course is how how firm and fast the greens were. And in the tournament, there was there was no rounds in the sixties. The first two rounds out of all the field, and there was only four rounds. Um, one on uh, in the sixties on Saturday, which I had a sixty eight, and. Um, there was three rounds on the 60s on, on Sunday, which was uh, myself, David Graham and Ian Baker Finch. Um, so it was, a, it was a tough old week. Yeah. So you're heading into the last round. Where, where, were, you, where were you positioned? I was tied for the lead with, with um, Paul Foley from Queensland. And, um, you know, the, the usual nerves, but I think uh, when I think back, uh, part of my focus that week was just staying calm. Yep. And um, I, had some, I was staying with friends and they were following me around and I was just trying to stay calm. But I, anyway, I, I found myself, um, I, I birdied four of the first seven holes and I, I opened up a six-shot lead. And, um, you know, a couple of stutters there for, on the, on the uh, ninth and eleventh holes, but then uh, an eagle on the twelfth, made a three-iron to about one foot, playing with Nick Price and Peter Senior. Wow. Um, and I, I mean, then I had a five shot lead and then finished three in front. But I, teeing off the last round playing with Nick Price, he was the, he was the star player and um, I thought he would win. So I, I sort of, I was just trying to play a good solid round of golf and um, anyway, just it, it unfolded the, just nicely for me. So you talk about Baker Finch and, and Grady, those those uh, Australians you were coming through with at the time, and Greg Norman. There would have been a, a perhaps a change into the guard at that stage. Who were some of the who were some of the players that you looked up to that would have been no doubt playing in that field um, at, at that time? Well, the the, the big stars they were Doug Graham, Graham Marsh, uh, Bob Shearer. Bob Shearer had won the Open in '82. Um, um, Bob Charles was playing in the event. Um, I played with Dennis Clark, another Kiwi, mm-hmm. and um, Jim Thorpe from America. He was he was playing as well. Um, so there was a, there was a few older ones, and I think it was like Peter Senior. He'd won a couple of events bef- 
before that, I think South Australia and, and somewhere else he's won them for years. But uh, I think by me winning an event, that event, then Mike Harwood won a couple of years later. And I think, I think it's sort of all of us sort of playing quite well sort of boosted each other. You know, Gwaine Grady, he'd won in the 78 in, in um, Adelaide and uh, and we were pushing each other along because we played a lot of tournaments and pro-ams together, mm. um, travelling and playing around the world and Asia and Europe and all that sort of stuff. So it was, it was yeah, you know, we were, we were the next lot after, um, you know, Bob Shearer and Stuart Ginn and Ian Stanley and, and these, these guys that uh, we all look up to. We, we love playing with them. So Europe's a fairly well trodden path for for Australians and and I guess you know the New Zealanders that make it up there and and you know particularly during those years you you mentioned some of those players you're with and you you tended to I guess travel together a fair bit and 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 build camaraderie and friendships and um, what, what was it like up in Europe you know for that period from eighty two uh, you know right right throughout to the end of the eighties yeah well when I started in Europe. Um... But you know, by the way, I, by winning the Australian Open, I finished top four in the Order of Merit in Australia. That exempted me into Europe, right. so that was a real that was a real bonus for '84. So I was straight back into into Europe, yep. and um, didn't have to. I never went to a tour school until 1996. So, okay. so, so I, I did quite well out of that. Um, but Europe was great because they had um, a lot of Argentinian players. Obviously, all the Europeans with the Spanish and Seve and, and these guys and the Germans and the Irish, the English, the Scottish. Um, but a lot of South Africans as well and, lo- and a lot of Aussies. I think at, at one stage there was 20 or 30 Australians playing in Europe. Um, so that was, it was great fun. And I, I think, you know, the tours were different back then. Um, I only had the main tour in America and then Europe and then Japan was only invitation only. So Europe was the next best place for the globetrotters, I suppose, from around the world to play. And it was a, you know, it was a great, a lot of, a lot of the top Aussies like Greg Norman and, and uh, Graham Marsh, they all started out in Europe. Norman Von Eider was um, probably started out in the thirties and then Peter Thompson and Kel Nagel and all those guys. But it's but it was a it's a great place to play. I really enjoyed playing in Europe. Now you you won your national open as we just discussed, and uh, and then you pulled, I guess, the jersey so to speak on for Australia, um, playing in a team event there with with Wayne Grady in the nineteen eighty nine World Cup, where you had some success. Uh, success. Talk me talk me through that week, and I guess you know some of the some of the matches you would have come up against. Um, and, and what it was like as an Australian to, to find yourself on on top of the world. Yeah, it was great. It was great to play with Wayne Grady because he he's a he was a top player and a, and a good friend of mine. And uh, um, and I and I, I was nineteen eighty nine was probably my best one of my best ever years. I had eighteen top tens in in Australia and Europe and throughout the world that year. So so I. I was very consistent. I had nine straight top tens in Australia, so I was um, I was playing pretty well. And uh, we had a grueling trip. It took us. Uh, we played the Australian PJ at Riverside Oaks the week before, and then we flew out. And uh, on the Sunday night, we didn't get there till midday on the Wednesday because it was there was there was fog and storms and all all those sort of things. So. Um, so we didn't have a practice round. The um, opening ceremony was called off for rain and right. storms. So, um, so the first, I, I, as soon as we arrived, we, we, we spent a whole night in the car um, in the middle of Spain, trying to trying to drive to the to the course in the south of Spain. So we our high rental car was, looked like. It had been to the Paris Dakar rally, <laughs> and Grades um, Grades said, "I go to go to sleep," and I said, "Well, you go to sleep. I'll go and walk the course and uh, do a do a yardage book for us, get all the measurements." So, I, so I did that. 
so our first look, our first game on the golf course was the first round on the on the Thursday, and um, and I remember we were we were playing with the Belgium team, and Belgium didn't have, didn't have a strong team back back then, uh, and um, I had a sixty six, grades had a six under, and grades had a sixty eight, and I think we were forty shots in front of the uh, the Belgium team after the first round, so that. Um, but what I remember about the the tournament was we were tied after after ten holes we were tied with America with the Americans. I don't know what score we were on at that stage, but yeah. the eleventh hole was a really tough long par three, surrounded by water, about a five iron shot, um, and Grades and I both hit it on the green. And Americans were playing in front; they were playing with the Spanish team. They were the, they were in front of us, and they were the, they were the they had all the crowds. They had the big. Uh, who, who was on the American side? There was uh, Mark McCumber and Paul Lazinger. Yeah. And um, for the Spanish type was Jose Maria um, Canizares, and, uh, or Candelaga as we used to call him, mm-hmm. and uh, Jose Maria Elizabeth, right. a young, good young player. So um, anyway, we're, we're on the... Uh, so we both hit on the green at 11. We both made hold out putts for birdie. For, and then the 12th hole was a... Par five that went down the right hand side of this of this water, and then the second shot it did a three wood across the water and across some trees to the green, or you just hit it down the fairway and then and then pitch it on. But I said to Wayne uh, Grady, I said, "Listen, mate, don't go down the fairway. Just hit a one iron straight between those two palm trees left of, the, and we're going to go left of the water down another fairway." And he said, you sure? And I said, absolutely positive. So we both ripped a one iron down through these palm trees down there, six iron on the green. We both hold it for eagle. And we picked up we picked up 10 shots on America and, and, and Spain just in those two holes. Right. And so we had a 10 shot lead after, I think, after the first round on, on them. And, uh, and then the, that was a beautiful day. And then the second day was washed out. It was rain. It was terrible. It rained all day and all night. Yep. And then eventually we got started on the um, on the Saturday for that for our second round. We we're playing with with Spain then, and they were really two two tough competitors, you know. And um, the the whole course was covered in water. And I remember we headed down the fairway on the first. That's about a sort of a seven or an eight iron to the green and. Um, Candelaga is in the middle of the fairway, but he's he said, I oh, can I get a drop from the casual water? And the official said, Yeah, you can. He said, and uh, and I remember they were looking around. The only place he could drop it was in the rough behind a tree. So we had to play it out. We had to play it out of the water. So Lazabar was really pissed off with that. I think he made a bogey there. And anyway, we. Uh, we battled around in, 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 the, in the water there for the, for the whole day. And uh, I remember on 17, I, I pushed my tee shot right and I'm in the trees. And I, I've, I've got about a nine iron length shot and I've, I'm in the trees and I get it under these trees and over some water to get to the green. But I was in casual water and I, I take a drop from casual water, yeah. So the only place we could drop it that was dry was on the middle of the 18th tee. That was the nearest nearest uh, point of relief. And Wayne Grady said to Lazabal, he said, you happy? Happy with that? He said, of course I'm not fucking happy, you know? <laughs> um, pardon the language, but that's exactly <laughs> what he said. Anyway, I knocked it on the green and we two putted and we, I think we, we still had about a five shot lead. But the way the course was, our whole thinking was we had to, we had to lead you know, after that round, because any more rain, then it would have been unplayable. And uh, and actually, that that particular day, I, maybe we we probably weren't five in front, but because I think a lot, uh, Canelaga had a uh, he shot six under on the back nine, so I think we only had a three shot lead or something like that. But I thought, Graves, we just got to be in front after this day. Yep. And um, and then it rained all night. And then it rained all the next morning, and about eleven o'clock, 
it became apparent that the rain wasn't going to stop. The forecast was terrible. And they called it off after the two rounds and uh, we were declared the winners. Uh, so, but that was a, you know, it was a great thrill. And, you know, like, I think it was Thompson and Nagel had won it one year before at Royal Melbourne. So we were the second uh, Australian team to win, so which I was really proud of. And, you know, with all the superstar names, yeah. I think um, I think Palmer and Nicholas won it at that course, Los Brisas it was in south of Spain, near Marbella. And uh, so they won on that golf course as well. And right. so it was a, it's a real thrill. Yeah, fantastic. Great achievement, Peter. Yeah. Um, we'll bring it back to, to Paraparumu Beach now. And obviously, at the start of the interview, we uh, you know we discussed your 1993, or we mentioned your 1993 victory. But it's been it's been really interesting in, in researching for uh, this interview uh, to actually see. I mean, your history at Paraparaba goes right back to, to 1984, where you uh, um, where you had a third placing, I believe, there um, behind Corey Pavin that that, that that won that year. So, was that your first visit to Paraparaba? I think it. I think it was. Yes, I think it was. Um, I remember it was burnt out that year. It was, you know, which often it does in the in the summer in uh, New Zealand. We get we get nice dry summers here, so it's which is great. Paraparams Paraparumu is a, a great. I think it's a great golf course. It's my favourite in New Zealand um, because it's always playable. Whether it's dry, it's wet, it's whatever condition it's in. I think it's. It's always playable and it's a good test of golf for, for the pros, but I think it's still playable for the, um, for the average guy. So I think it's, that's why I think, I think a good golf course is one that's always playable. Royal Melbourne's like that as well. So, um, you know, it's very well designed and, and Lynx courses generally are always in pretty good shape. You know, it's, uh, it's amazing. Um, they don't change much um, and they're always in great shape. But I remember... 1984 was burned out. Um, Corey Pavin was a was a star then. I, he he played well in Europe in '83, so I knew him well. Right. And uh, and uh, Terry Gale, I think I think Parrot Pavin was about 19 under, and I think Terry Gale finished second at about 16 under. I think I was 10 under, about third. But um, but I yeah, really really enjoyed that course from then on. And then you, uh, you know, obviously the, the New Zealand Open was a relatively uh, regular fixture there during the 80s and into the 90s. Um, 1988, you're back again where Ian Stanley uh, won. And we've yeah. discussed, um, we've, we've had a chat with Mike Clayton on this series as well. And, and to be honest, Peter, I thought Mike Clayton was going to be the first to drop an F-bomb, but um, <laughs> you'll beat him to oh, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mike, Mike talks about the last day, um, which was a, incredibly windy. Uh, he describes hitting a four iron, I think, into the 16th, which is a 126 metre hole. Uh, now, you were tucked in just behind that as well, so you clearly played pretty well uh, during that event yourself. What, what's your what's your memories of 1988? Um, well, first of all, my my uh, my wife's um, younger sister. Who was I think was only sixteen at the time. Caddied for Mike Clayton the week before in at the airlines tournament in Titarangi, oh. and she, he got her to come down with us all and um, caddy for him down there. So that was she didn't she never played golf. She never caddied before, but she I think Mike finished top ten at, at Titarangi and then and then finished second with uh, Melissa catting for him the, the the following week. That's that's the one thing I remember. It'd be a nice payday and, uh, there for uh, Melissa. Yeah, good. Oh yeah, that's exactly. And uh, but she enjoyed it, and I know I know Mike, Mike was a top player, so um, you know that was a that was a great week. I can't remember my golf, but that's what I remember from that <laughs> from that year. Nineteen ninety two. Um, you started one shot behind Grant Waite in that last round, and there again. Peter Fowler, not too far from the lead at Paraparumu Beach. Yeah, it's sort of... Um, yeah, I, I can't remember how many shots I finished behind Grant, but, um, but yeah, I played well that week. Um, you know, got Paraparumu, to me, is a... Um, you've got to drive the ball well, but you've got to be good around the greens. There's a lot of small greens there, so you miss a lot of greens, and you've got to have a good, good short game. So that... 
I drove the ball well and, and um, my short game was pretty good again. So, but one one th- one thing I remember about that week is Grant held a, he held a, his second shot on the 18th for for an albatross. I I don't know it was the second or third round, but uh, second, so I think we're second pretty, round on the on the Friday. Yeah, we're gonna second. We're gonna, so I think we're about pride and all them, and then that sort of pushed him three ahead, and uh, and I think I I think he finished about three ahead at the end. Yeah, a couple, a couple of hit, a couple of hit of you, yeah. But um, you know that sets you up for 1993 and, and, and 1993 in general. And, and, and we'll we'll kick it off with the New Zealand Open. But again, you know, you said 89 was a good year for you. It looks like 93 was it was a great year for you as well. And uh, you've won a you've won an, um, an Australian Open as an Australian citizen. You've just told me that you've uh, got citizenship now of, of New Zealand. Uh, and, and here you are lining it up on our open once again at a course you clearly love. Yeah, it's a, it, that's right. It's um, yeah, '93 was a good year, and um, obviously coming close in in '92 that sort of set me up, and so I had the mentality to to go one better in '93, and, and uh, which I did, and uh, and also it was um, I lost a playoff to this for the Australian PGA in '93, but also but I won the uh, the BMW International Open in Munich, uh, which is a favourite tournament of mine in Europe, uh, in '93 as well. So yeah, I had a few good weeks that year, and uh, and um, you know, it's great to win. And you got to win certain tournaments and 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 on certain types of golf courses. So winning on links courses was a great thrill for me. So tell me, how do you? You know, how do you attack Paraparamu under under stroke play conditions and the pressure of a New Zealand Open? I mean, we've got those first five holes, which you you um, you know you kind of struggle to get through the five, and then there's a lot of minefields there, and then you got a little bit of um, you know six through eight, you can you can make up some ground, and and well, probably even a little bit more than that, and then you kind of hang on coming home. But you, you started that last round in '93 with a birdie on the second and a birdie on the third, so you part you you started pretty hot. Yeah, it's a yeah. Well, I drove the ball. Driving, I, I worked out that you had to drive the ball well, and with a driver. I don't think you, you can sort of bail out those first five holes, as you, as you said. You know, the first holes are. If you hit a good drive, you can have a wedge from the from a flat lie. But if you hit it, a, another club off the tee in a weak drive, you'll be on a there's a bit of a downslope there on the first hole from many years since I've been there now, but uh, um, I, I just know that's that's important. Um, second hole's a tough long par three, and again, the, it's really hard to hit the third fairway. So it doesn't matter what you hit off the tee, you're a lottery whether you even hit the fairway because of all the humps and hollows of a typical links course. So just get it down there as far as you can and. Um, because the green's very small. This is another reason why you have to drive it rather than laying up off the tee because you need a short iron to hit those greens. So, um, and then, uh, I mean, the fourth hole's a long par four. That was always a tough drive through the hills. Yeah. And then you got that really nasty um, par three, the fifth, which I think the fifth and the 16th holes are probably the two, two of the best holes on the course. Um, Great par threes, not long. No. Um, I think probably what the fifth is only about 155 yards, 140 meters. Correct. And um, and 16. Would you say 126 meters? 126 yeah. meters, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so with a really 140. A really yards. skinny green. That's a great, great design, great uh, holes. But the other hole, the other great hole on the golf course is the 17th long par four. With a with a tough green to hit, so a tough fairway to hit, and then a tough green to hit. So I think it's a a real classic classic hole. So you talked about you know having to play your short irons, but there was um, there was a long iron uh, that you played in particular. You played it twice, uh, which looks like it set up that victory. And it was it was a one iron. Uh, you hit it on seven to to twelve feet and, and got your birdie there, and. Uh, the 18th, you hit it again and, and, and birdied the last. I guess you would have had a little bit of comfort. It looks like you had a couple of shots there, but uh, you don't. You don't. Obviously, you don't see the one iron a lot these days. 
No, you don't. You know, you don't see a one or a two on very much these days. Some occasionally a two on, but most of the guys are using five woods. The, the balls don't spin as much as they used to, so so they're using a lot more loft now to get the ball in the air. You know, in my early days, I was trying to keep it low, and now now I'm trying to get it in the air. So it's a contrast in sort of styles. Um, you know, when you play golf for over forty years. So, but um, yeah, one yeah. Yeah, one arm was a good club on my bag. I remember Matt Sullivan, a good Kiwi friend of mine and a great golf family in New Zealand, was caddying for me. And I, I, if I if I'd parred the seventeenth, I was going to play the eighteenth of the three shotter because there's a, there's a at the time there's out of bounds on the right where that creek and the and the practice fairway is. So I don't know if it's still there, but yeah, it's still there. But it was then. And there was heavy rough on the left-hand side of the fairway. So, but I remember the wind was in out of the left, which is not a good drive. But anyway, I, I managed to bogey um, 17. So I just ripped the driver out of the bag and walked back to the tee. And I probably hit the best drive of, of my life. Hard down the left-hand side, a real stinger. And, and, it, um, and it ran out nice. And that left me a one-iron to the green. Pin was sort of back right, back past the, the front bunker. And I just hit the best one iron ever. I just hit it straight at the left-hand edge of the green, faded it in the middle of the green, 20 foot away, two putt to win. I, I think I won by two in the end. But uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tough uh, tough hole to make the – to hit a couple of good shots on. But, um, yeah, I remember those two shots very well. Pretty uh, Pretty rewarding at the end of the day. Peter, when you you held the uh, silverware up, and, and what was what was it like, you know, post post the New Zealand Open? What did you were you staying locally up here on the on the coast, or were you in in the city? Um, no, I stayed um, I stayed in Paraparaumu, pretty pretty close, and uh, I think I've stayed a few times. I don't know if the motel's still there on the tenth hole, yeah, just left yeah. of the tenth. Yeah, like, um, it's not a motel at the moment, but it, it probably hasn't had a decor change since you stayed there in 93. No, I remember the lino tables and the lino <laughs> floors. It was pretty basic, but a fantastic location to uh, just to stay at. And um, so I really enjoyed it there. And, um, you know, the town was lovely. And the, and the golf course, unfortunately, we don't get to play there much these days. But um, it's, I, st- I still think it's, it's definitely my favourite in New Zealand even with these other fantastic golf courses that they've got. So you touched on just before back up in Europe, uh, your victory up there at the 93 BMW Championship in Germany. Um, I mean, yeah, what was it What was it like to win up there? I mean, it's, you're winning on a, on a pretty big stage, the European Tour. Yeah, no, that was that was great. It's a, it's a fantastic tournament. I know the... Um, um, I'm good friends with the promoter of the tournament who runs the, the tournament for BMW because um, he was assistant pro when I first when we first played there and then he went on to, you know, to run the tournament. Um, so I, I was very friendly with him and, and uh, they, ran a, they ran a fantastic event. Munich's just a beautiful city to go to. Anybody that wants to trip around and wants to know where to go, Munich's uh, one of the places. So, uh, in Bavaria there, it's beautiful, but um, they had a great field, Sandy Lyle, Ian Worsden, Bernard Langer, and, and all the regular crew, they were, I think Sevi was playing as well, so um, it was a good, but I, I, I love the golf course, it has it had good practice facilities, uh, I always play pretty well when they've got good facilities to practice, and you can just chill out and work on your game, and uh, so yeah, I, I it was a great week, and um, I remember uh, I, was, I was a couple of shots behind, but starting the last round, but I managed to hit every green on the golf course. I hit four, four par fives in two, and um, I remember hitting the pin with my three wood on the ninth, and dropped down about a yard away and made eagle there. Um, but anyway, shot and then hit the. There's water and out of bounds down the left hand side of the 18th, and uh, and water on the right hand side of the green, and I, I ripped a drive there and hit a 
five wood on the middle of the green and two putter there to shoot 63 and uh, beat Worsden by a couple of shots, I think. So it was a, it was a great last round and uh, and I didn't I I I didn't know, but Ian Worsden had bogeyed the um, 17th. He was in the group behind me. Um, so I didn't have to drive her, and then I didn't have to five wood at the green. But I, I thought that he he would have parred it, so I needed a birdie to beat him. So I went for it, even though with the out of bounds on the water, and, uh, right. and Mike Clayton jumping up and down the clubhouse. No, lay it up, lay it up. But I didn't know, you know. So anyway, I, I finished in style. Yeah. So so you've had a great ninety three, but then it it. it appears that you, your game went a little bit quiet there towards the back end of the 90s. What was what was the difference? Yeah, I, I don't know. I sort of... I, I, in the second half of 94, I started playing terrible. And, um, you know, you, I guess after being on the tour for 20-odd years or 25 years and that, you go up and down. Yeah, you have a few ups and downs. Mm. Whether, you know, technical problems sink in or you mentally get exhausted. Um, you know, I'd, I'd, uh, I had four kids by then, so that sort of, you know, you got a lot of responsibilities. So anyway, by, by the middle of 96, you know, my game was completely shot and uh, missed. You know, I, ha- I did get a couple of invites in 96 because my... I missed my card in the end of 95. And, uh, but then in the end, it was embarrassing getting an invite when you played so badly. So I thought my game and I thought was, was um, completely finished after, after that. So we moved from London back to my wife. I said to my wife, where do you want to live? And she said, oh, well, Auckland, where her family is. So we moved to Auckland and, uh, and that's, uh, this is where we've been ever since. But, um, it seems like it was a it was a good move, Peter, because um, one of those. Well, whilst we just talked about it down, the the, the up came again. Uh, two thousand and two to two thousand and four, you found yourself back up in Europe, and uh, yeah, that was and a, it was a bit of a miracle. It was a it was a amazing how it happened, really, because I thought I was gone from golf, yeah. and uh, and I was teach in the, the late nineties, ninety seven, ninety eight, ninety nine. I was teaching in um, doing some short game coaching uh, in New Zealand. Uh, and Mel Tung, who was, who was a great coach, I think, and uh, a real asset to New Zealand back in the, in the 90s, was um, he was a national coach and he got me to come down to, the, to coach the, the national squad in their, in their winter camp in the Manor Park. So we, uh, I, I went down there every year and, and, and tried to help him out with, I passed on what I knew about the, the short game to the young Kiwis. Gareth Patterson was one of those who, um, and he worked hard on his on his game and his short game, and he, and that's why he, he's been a, a good solid player all these years. And uh, and um, and during those camps, and then Mel was giving me a few lessons and trying, but I, I was terrible. And uh, and he, he he said that he. So I couldn't believe how bad, bad you were then. But he said, if you're willing to stand on the practice fairway all day, I was willing to coach you. So he really got me going again. And I think I must have gone to the Asian tour school back at one of those years and um, to see if I could play a few few tournaments. And I remember in, in 99, we're playing a tournament in Singapore. I still wasn't playing very good, you know, like I was... I was still horrible, but uh, I remember when we were, it was a tournament in Singapore and, and a month prior to that, I, I rang my mate up from Munich, BMW tournament, and I said, would, would BMW pay half my flight if I came back and play one more year? And he said, yeah, sure, they'd love to, they'd love to have you. So they paid half my flight and paid for my accommodation, so that, otherwise I wouldn't have been able to afford to go. And... Uh, so I got back to Munich and I made the cut, which was miraculous. Finished 30, yeah. made 5,000 pounds. Back in those days, it was worth about 15,000 Kiwi dollars. So that was a good, that would have been an outstanding coaching week. Yeah. Um, and I remember on the, on, once I made the cut, I was talking to Sam Torrance in the bar on the Friday night. And he said, well, how long are you over for? And I said, no, just this week. 
I said, I'd love to play in Scotland at the at Glen Eagles next week, but, you know. And he said, oh, my management company's running the tournament. How about... And so he said, hang on a second. He rang them and he said, yeah, you're in. So I stayed another week, made the cut there and finished 30th, another 5,000 pounds. So once I was in Scotland, I I, I, caught, I, I rang the guys up from um, the, around the Swiss Open who the... There's, there's, there's a, the Barris family who they almost own the whole town in Crans sur Sierre and the Swiss Alps, but they and they own the tournament. So I rang them up and uh, they didn't have any invites left. But Sergio Garcia, who was a young player at the time, he hadn't committed yet. So he said, I, he just said he kept saying, "Ring me in a few days, ring me in a couple of days, you know, ring me tomorrow, ring me this afternoon." So for the rest of the week when I was in Scotland, I kept ringing. And uh, anyway, it, it seemed like it wasn't going to happen. But on the Tuesday of the Swiss Open, he rings me up and said, you're in. So I went over there and made the cut again. Another 5,000 pounds for 30th place. So not, not outstanding weeks, but the way I'd been playing a lot, few previous years, that was outstanding. And it, was, it was then that I decided to go back to the European Tour School, which I'd never been before. And, uh, and I remember I was right on the borderline, six rounds of golf in the south of Spain in November. And in November in Spain, it's, it's misty and it's raining and it's not the best weather. It's not like they normally have in the summer. And I remember I was right on the borderline in the sixth round and I shoot six under par the last nine holes to finish 15. And, uh, and from that, I got 10 more years in Europe, which I really think that that really helped me. And then I played all the way up until I was 50 years old. And that's, that really helped me play well on the seniors tour. So it was, you know, things could have changed, been a lot different, but uh, they all opened up for me. It's interesting. I mean, you, you know, you've played a lot of pro-ams and you would have played with a lot of... Um you know, younger guys and older guys that, uh, that you know, have, have fantastic swings and, and, and grind it out and have great intentions, but perhaps never make it up onto, onto some of those tours you've discussed. I mean, what's, what's the difference? What, you know, you've, you've discussed a little bit of luck there. Um, you know, how does someone that's, that's playing the Pro-Am circuit in New Zealand, you know, graduate to that next step? Yeah, I think these days... Um the guys aren't playing enough um, because back when I started, you know, there was Peter Senior, there was Mike Harwood, Wayne Grady, and a host of other. Ian Baker Finch. You know, we 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 we, we all play, and we spoke about it now. I said we we all played for about five or six years. We played forty tournaments a year, easy. Right. Wayne Grady when he when he got his US tour card. The tour school with his 22nd week in a row. Grind, you know, we did, we weren't playing for a lot of money back in the in the you know the end of the 70s and the and the 80s. So we were grinding, we were grinding it out, and that's where you get the mental toughness. You know, we didn't have great swings like they've got now, and we weren't as strong and fit as they are now. We just ground it out and. Uh, we all say that, you know, after six years, that the guys have they haven't played a hundred tournaments, haven't played a hundred weeks. You know, and I speak to a lot of them that are on the fringes, great looking players, and they said, "Oh yeah, I'm not playing any pro ams, and no good for your golf." So they so they sit in their bums for two or three months before the tournament. So when the tournaments come around, if they don't fire up quickly, they just get left behind. And I think that's. So I, I love my, we, we didn't play Pro-Ams thinking that they are a waste of time. We, we thought we were on the tour. That's, that's what you did. And you, that's all we could get into. So we, we played as hard as we could. As soon as we got in, once you get into the big tours, you can start, you know, managing your, your workload then. But you've, you've got to learn all the skills and the, tough, the mental toughness, grinding it out. Like we were, we were, Travelling around in trains, planes, and automobiles—you know—we didn't. Uh, it wasn't uh, very flash. Um, 
and um, but that's that's the way. And I think it was it was great for us. And it, you know, and all the, all those players I, I spoke about, they're all mentally tough. That's what you've got to be on the tours. It's great having a great swing and everything, but the mental toughness that gives you the that pushes you in there. You know, like a Greg Norman, mentally tough. You know, Peter Senior is and, and Roger Davis are the ultimate mental toughness guys. Right. You know, Bernard Langer. You know that. You know, like. Bernard Langer, he, he plays well now because he's the first guy there on the Monday morning practicing for the tournament. And the other guys just swan in casually on a Tuesday and that, but he's he's done a whole, he's done a day and a half's work before anybody else arrives. So that's why he still plays well. And that's you know, that's why Peter Senior plays well. Worked hard, Mike Harwood. You know? It's interesting, um, in chatting with um, Michael Clayton earlier in the series. He described you as one of the hardest working golfers that he's known. He said you would have been a professional nearly 40 years and he said you probably played 40 tournaments a year for those 40 years. Yep. Which you, yeah, which even, you just... even, even since I've been a senior, I've play, I played about 25 weeks a year from starting in sort of June until the end of the year. So, And then I play about 10 before that. And, but that's our big workload. But... Uh, you know, like it hasn't it hasn't it hasn't hurt me, and I I feel like I've got to work on my game. You know, golf hasn't. I don't feel like it came easy to me. I've had to work at it from the beginning. And uh, you know, my old coach Ian Alexander, he always said, he said, he said, you've got to you've got to work hard. You've got to know that you've done it yourself. No one else is going to do it for you. And um, and that's how I've been. And uh, even when I felt like I was struggling, you know, I still had my card almost 30 years in Europe, you know. So I've seen some fantastic players never have a tour card. And, you know, so, I, I, so I'm pretty proud of the fact that, you know, I've had a tour card for so long and, and even when I felt like I was struggling. So you, you've um, you've touched on the seniors, and, and you're playing a lot of seniors golf now. And, and you, you've obviously you played seniors golf really well, uh, you know, as well. You've uh, had seven seven victories, is it up on seven, up on seven victories in Europe? Yeah, and, and one just very recently. Is it, was it 2009? Yeah, I won in uh, Seychelles in last last December. So that was great. That was great work, you know, as a 60 year old. So that I was uh, yeah. I was pretty pumped with that. And what, what, what keeps you dri- what keeps you driven? What's um you know what what keeps you jumping on the plane and and, and heading up to Europe and, and and turning up on the Monday and working hard? Well, you know, golf golf's been my life. I, lo- I like to play good golf, um, and like I said, you know, like it was never easy for me. So I, uh, but I like to I like to compete and play well, I just don't want to make up the numbers. So that's why I work hard. And uh, and one of the bonuses you get is you get to travel the world, you know, like, you know, if I didn't play golf, I wouldn't have ever got to Europe or, or wouldn't have got to America or Japan or, or Seychelles or Mauritius. Yeah. And last year we played in Madagascar for the first time. So that was the first ever golf tournament in Madagascar. Oh. So proud to be part of that. Um, that's exciting. And all the, all the people you meet, Got a lot of great friends from around the world, and and without golf, you know, I wouldn't have had that opportunity. So, you know, I wouldn't be living in New Zealand if I didn't play golf. So, so it's uh, so I understand that, and I'd like it to continue. You know, my you know my youngest daughter, she she's a model and travels around the world. So she sort of she does what I, or well, probably more more travelling than I do, but. Um, you know, I've got three kids living in Sydney and uh, so, yeah, playing golf, I can get to travel and see them all and, and meet a lot of people. Yeah, nice, Peter. Well, Peter, it's been fantastic chatting to you. Um, you know, as Mike said, you, you're a hard-working individual and that's certainly come through in, in what you've said to us today. You're a, you're a proud Australian, but it's great to hear that you're also now a proud New Zealander. You've won national opens in, in, in the respective countries. Uh, you've won in Europe. You've won on the seniors tour. Um, you still sounds like you're knocking out 40 tournaments a year 
Um, for that reason, Peter, it's been wonderful to talk to you. You are a legend of the links, and uh, we look forward to welcoming you back to Paraparumu Beach and perhaps, uh, you know, walking down 18 with you and, and, and seeing you pull that one iron out again and, and, and relive some of those special memories that you've had at our place. Yeah, hopefully you can get a senior Legends Tour event down there at Paraparumu one year. That'd be great. Yeah, it sounds, sounds good. And, uh, yeah, well, obviously I, I, I love living in New Zealand. Obviously played for Australia in the World Cup. But in, in the, in the, on the Legends Tour, we have the Nagel... Charles, um, which is a match play tournament, Australia versus New Zealand, and I played for New Zealand in that, and we won that a couple. Of, I won that a couple of times, but that was that was great fun. I bet, your, mate, my, I bet your mates love that. My, my Aussie mates didn't like that at all, <laughs> but anyway, it was great fun. Good on you, Peter. Take care, and we look forward to seeing you on the links at some stage. Thanks, Leanne. Uh, Cheers. Thank you.